Chapter 17, Zoe I thought you were taking me home, I said glancing over at David. His face a new gloominess, a clenched jaw, no emotion. His body language signaled to me he was dangerous. He didn't say a word, he kept his eyes straight and hands on the wheel, and stepped on the accelerator and the car zoomed down the dark road. I didn't get upset until a few minutes had passed, and he turned down the highway that took us by and passed my home. Then the car drove three miles to a secluded area, with a large fence and a decorative black iron gate. I planned my getaway if I were ever kidnapped again. There wasn't any plan for friends and acquaintances. Only strangers. People who are upstanding and appeared to be leaders in the community had been left out of my plan. It was too late to think about that now. I hushed a moan and pushed back a tear. Wanting to cry for Sebastian, I realized it was too late. He was the one who warned me to stay in the house and don't let anyone in. I didn't take him seriously. How could I because he didn't tell me what I was up against, and if he had, I probably wouldn't have paid attention to him anyway. I had to blame but myself. David stepped out and opened the gate. My plan was to get out and run, but when I looked around, I didn't know where I could run to. Where the hell was I anyway? So I sat there like a fool, thinking I could reason with him. Where are you taking me? My voice was calm and light. Not like before where you could hear panic. Didn't your parents tell you never to get into a car with a stranger? And all the nightmares of my childhood came rushing back to haunt me. I was five years old and all I had to do was walk around the block to school, climb the stairs and walk through the doors, and I would have been safe. But just as I turned the corner, the school gate was there when someone, I think it was a man, strode up to me smiling and said that my father was sick, and I needed to go with him, and I climbed into the van and that's all I remember. However this time, I'm not a five-year-old, I'm tough, and I won't let him control me and make me afraid of the dark anymore. What do you want with me? Is it sex? Then you don't have to kidnap me to get that. I will give it to you freely. You're handsome enough man, and my husband is always working. Not like you. I will gladly fuck you. And I won't tell my husband, I said soft and low. I looked at him, and shot him my most seductive smile. Who was I kidding? Seduction wasn't my strong suit. I was more the timid type who tried to act tough by throwing a fuck you out to make me fit in. And seduction, I wore blouses that button up to my chin to keep men from looking at me. Everyone except Sebastian, because he doesn't count. He's dead anyway. I told David everything I thought he wanted to hear, and still he didn't respond. He just drove on and didn't say a word or turn to look at me. He drove up to a rundown mansion. There were no lights in it when he stopped the car and got out and walked around to my door. I sat looking at him through the window. Get out, he shouted with a hoarse cold and unfeeling voice. Not like Sebastian. Sebastian's voice remained warm no matter how he tried to harden it. David extended his hand and gave me a heartless smile. He didn't smile with his eyes. They appeared lifeless and just as unfriendly as his voice. He glanced at me with a raised eyebrow. I don't want any bullshit from you. Now get out. I didn't say much because he appeared capable of hurting me. It was then I decided to cooperate. Stepping out on the rain-soaked leaves, all I heard was the beating of my heart and my shoes crunching through piles of wet dead leaves. Is this your place? I said with a tremble of my lips. I had to try to get him to warm up and talk to me. Yes, my father left it to me and mountains of debt, he said scowling. His eyebrows meeting and slanting downward. He opened the door and we walked inside where candles were lit and I saw a house in disrepair. Thrown to the side was mountains of newspapers and wood near the fireplace. 
He walked away from me as I watched at him. He left me standing in one spot as I tried to gauge should I run. He looked back at me when he picked up the logs and threw them in the fireplace. He lit them and stepped back. Sit over there. He pointed to a large old brown worn leather wingback chair. There were two of them, and he sat across from it and stared into the fire. Are you hungry? No, I said. What an absurd question. He behaved as if we were on a date. What did he expect from me? He takes me against my will to his home, and now he's offering me food. It's not like I'm your guest. He watched me. I shouldn't have said that. But of course you're a guest. He smiled. And there are other guests who will come to get you, and all my worries will be over. I can leave this forsaken place and never have to see it again. Maybe I'll burn it down. What guest are you talking about? My voice showed my panic. Not anger. The ones who will bring me money and take you. Who are you? Someone who needs money, he said. If you're looking for money, we're rich. I mean, Sebastian is rich, and he will pay whatever price you ask. He doesn't have enough money for what I need. How do you know? I said to him. I had to talk him out of this insane idea. I can get the money from him. Whatever you need. Just tell me what it is you need. Now my voice showed panic. Why would I take your word for anything when Samantha promised me a fortune? Samantha, did you say, Samantha, she's a witch? I don't give a fuck what she is, she promised me the world, and I'm taking her up on it. The only thing she will give you is nothingness. She will suck the life out of you, I said looking at him with horror because he didn't realize who he was dealing with. I didn't know if she had money, but I did know women wouldn't give up a dime if they didn't have to. What Sebastian will do you will be far worse. He laughed at the notion. Did you ask Samantha why she wants me? I don't care. Stop talking. You make my head hurt. And his eyes began opening and closing, and he rubbed his head. He stood and wavered. His legs appeared weak as he strode near me. I'd better tie you up. I jumped up and started to run, and he caught me and held my hands behind my back and forced me down to the chair. You're not going anywhere. I could kill you, but she wants you alive. When he was trying to hold me to tie my hands, I bit his shoulder and kicked him, and then bit his hand as he held me. Stop being difficult. I don't want to hurt you. What do you expect me to do? Sit there as you sell me to someone. Do you know what she will do to me and you? As long as she brings me my money, I don't give a fuck. I don't want to hurt you now shut up and stop trying to get out of the ropes because you can't. All you're going to do is bruise your body. She doesn't want you bruised. If you don't want to hurt me, then let me go. I promise I won't say anything about this, and I'll get you the money Samantha promised you. After he tied my hands behind the chair, my feet were still flailing around. I wished he would stand in front of me, so I could give him a swift kick in the balls. But he knew that trick. I can't let you go. I've gone too far, he said breathlessly. When are your guests coming for me? I needed to know how much time I had left. I didn't know the time, but the way he was acting he expected them soon. That's when I got the bright idea of mental telepathy. If I could focus on Sebastian, then maybe he could find me. I calmed my body and placed my head down and breathed soft and low. I tuned out everything and everyone, and I focused on Sebastian in the hospital. Find me, Sebastian, I'm in trouble. Help me, Sebastian. Come for me. Then I repeated it in a low voice. Find me, Sebastian. I'm in trouble. Help me, Sebastian. 
come for me. And I threw in what I thought would make him find me, if he was a true vampire. I love you, Sebastian, only you can save me, I murmured. What are you whispering about? No one knows you're here but me and Samantha, and she should be here soon, David said with a light, happy, airy tone. As the time grew near for Sebastian to get home, I began to realize that things may be futile with my rescue. Then I began to doubt Sebastian's story about the vampire, werewolf, and witch thing. A small bird like the one I had seen outside my window flew into the large dusty room and flitted over where David had fallen asleep, near my chair, as he held tight onto the rope. Whenever I twisted around in the chair, he woke. It had been an exhausting few days, and it became hard to keep my eyes open. I teetered between asleep and wake. When my eyes focused, standing before me was Samantha. This time she stood in front of me close where I saw her dark eyes. She was dressed in black and smiling. What's with the black dress, Samantha, and who died? I figured she was a woman like me, and I still didn't buy into the witch thing. The question is who is about to die? You have summoned Sebastian, and when he comes for you, he will die with you. Two star-crossed lovers, but instead of committing suicide together, I will kill you and cause his demise at the same time. You can't kill a vampire, I said, not too sure of that, but still holding on to my notion that Sebastian isn't a vampire because if he had been he would have been here by now. And how did Samantha get in here? I thought maybe David left the door open. Yes I know I can't kill him that easy but you can, and you just did with your mind games. I never could contact him, but you managed to do it. Ha! Huh. Why are you talking when I'm trying to sleep, Zoe? David said, as he wiped the sleep from his eyes, then looking up at Samantha with a ready smile. Because your important guest has arrived. David stood up and passed his hand over his face and eyes, and then wiped the drool from his mouth with his sleeve. Samantha, how did you get in here? A little bird let me in, she said. I glanced at David, and he gave me a slanted confused look. She's a witch, you dummy, and no one is walking out here alive, I tried to get him to understand, but he was like me until now, a non-believer. Samantha walked up to David, and put her hands to his face to kiss him, as he stood directly in front of me. He leaned in ready for the kiss of a lifetime with a beautiful receptive woman, and they locked together in a heated kiss. It was erotic. Their bodies melded together, and his tongue extended into Samantha's mouth, and his breathing became intense. At one moment I thought David would lay her at my feet, rip her clothes off, and fuck her in front of me as I sat bound in that chair. His mouth roamed over her shoulders, down her breasts, and back to her open mouth. What I thought was sheer lust with the moaning and heavy breathing coming from David, was Samantha, sucking the life out of David literally. His body turned an ash gray and then it shrunk, and she threw it to the side like a dirty piece of paper. My eyes followed his stiff corpse as it landed near the fireplace. You are dangerous to men, I said narrowing my eyes. She took it as a compliment. She reveled in her dominance and cold hardiness. That's only if there is nothing I want from them any longer. What good are they? What did you want from Sebastian? She looked away. Her dark eyes softened as if she had remembered a time when she was in love with him, and he had loved her as well. I didn't know, because he didn't speak about her in a loving, caring way. When he mentioned her name, it was as if she was someone he wanted to forget. His love. I wanted his love, she said her voice weak as she turned quickly to face me. Now her eyes were cold. He gave it to you, and that's why I will see you dead in the most horrible way. But first Sebastian will die, and you will witness it very soon, and when he can no longer protect you I will be back for you. When you have forgotten me and gone on with your life, I will be there to take your life from you. Now call your lover and she disappeared into thin air, 
with a wisp of cold air remaining after she left. I shivered from the cold, but then I noticed that the fire had gone out. It was too late. She knew I had summoned Sebastian, and she knew he would come. It was almost daylight. I watched at a grandfather's clock tick away, and now it was seven o'clock, and at seven ten the sun would rise. I hoped he wouldn't come for me. I wished I didn't have the power to summon him. Why should I think I have that kind of power over a vampire? Who do I think I am? And there was no way Sebastian would commit suicide just to save me. Placing my head down, I wished him away. He could find another woman like me. It's not like Samantha harmed me. Don't let him come. Please don't let Sebastian come for me. I found myself pleading into the air. When I looked up, he was standing before me. My heart fell and broke into a thousand pieces. Chapter 18 Zoe How could you be so stupid as to fall into Samantha's trap? I shouted. Didn't you hear me wish you away? I said to Sebastian. He had a look of relief and one of contempt for me. It doesn't work that way. I heard you beg for me to come for you. He waved his hand and the ropes dropped and I stood. Now how are you going to get home in five minutes? I can't. Tears poured down my face. You have to. I can't make it without you. I need you, I said. He just stood and watched me with this sad look on his face, as if he would never see me again. Sebastian took me in his arms. There is so much I want to tell you, Zoe. But I can't now. You're giving up. Isn't there something you can do? What am I going to do without you? I questioned, looking up at him. I looked at his face, and then it came to me. I began remembering that I had seen that face when I was a teen. You're him. You're the one. And I watched as the sun crept into the large room, and soon the room will be filled with blinding light. Taking his hand, follow me. Where are we going, he said. Down. There must be a basement or cellar someplace. Try the doors, I said, rushing to the first door I found. That wasn't it. Just a closet. Not enough protection, he said. I ran to the kitchen, and then I saw a door. I pulled at it, but it was locked. It's here, Sebastian, but it's locked. It's a cellar. Standing behind me, he pulled at the door, and the old lock fell to the floor, and we stood looking into the dark cellar. Sebastian turned to me, his eyes wide and smiling, and he walked down. I followed. Where are you going? he questioned. With you. There are probably rats down here. Then I'll wait for you until it gets dark. I closed the door and looked at the kitchen. Thinking about the body of David lying in the room caused me to lose my appetite. I walked slowly back to the living area and sat in the chair. My eyes closed. One moment I wondering what to do with David, and the next I'm asleep. When I woke, I didn't know how long I had been out. But when I heard a knock at the door, I didn't rush to open it. I stood behind the door and listened for a voice. Zoe, are you there? It was Anne. I unbolted the locks on the door and opened it a little and peeped out. Oh, thank God you're okay, she said. Can I come in? Yes. She looked at me. Is everything okay with you? I opened the door wide. By now I had calmed down and wasn't walking weak-legged. But how could I explain David's decomposing stiff corpse? When she walked past the foyer and into the large room, I heard a gasp. Did you do that? No. Of course not, I whispered into my hands. Who did it? A witch. She didn't act as if she was surprised or confused or thought I was out of my mind. 
It was as if it was natural to speak of witches with dead bodies. Serves him right. Every time a woman dates him, she disappears, and he comes up with some kind of excuse. We suspected something. He just came across the wrong woman, that's all. She inhaled and exhaled, staring down at him. I wanted to agree with her, but I wondered how she knew I was still at David's house. How did you know I was here? When Dr. Sebastian was waiting for David to arrive, I told him that David met us at the bar across town and that he drove you home last night. If you had seen the doc's face. I can imagine, I said. He tried calling you but you didn't answer, and he left out without David covering for him. I asked the girl at the desk to stay there so I could check on David. I get here and see Dr. Sebastian's car. You can imagine what I thought. Someone was dead or hurt. Out here if a man finds his wife in another man's house, and with David's reputation, it doesn't end well. She walks around me and stoops to look at David. What a mess, and he was kind of cute before this. Anne glanced around at me, where's the doc? In the cellar. What's he doing in the cellar? She didn't flinch when I said David was killed by a witch, but she cringed when I mentioned the cellar. So I decided to come clean with her. He's in the cellar because he's a vampire. Oh. That makes perfect sense then. With the sun up, I can understand. She blew out a deep breath. That was smart, Anne said. Did you hear me? I said puzzled and looking at her with my mouth ajar. Yeah. Now, what are we going to do about David? You can let him lie there and stink up the place. I know. Or I can call Robbie. Who's Robbie? My boyfriend, of course. It won't take him long to get over here. He likes jobs like this. Kind of weird like that, she said wrinkling her nose. I'd say he is, but beggars can't be choosers. My mother would say. Do you think he would do that for me? No, but he would do anything for me. She reached in her pocket for her cell phone and walked to the side and called Robbie. Then she turned to me, he's coming. Before I could turn and say anything, the bell rang and then a knock. I looked at Anne. That's Robbie. Already? He was nearby. I walked behind her, be sure it wasn't the police she had called. It wasn't because he was dressed in a leather vest and jeans, with tattoos all over his body. Robbie stood over six feet and Anne barely four feet. They looked like an odd couple. More odd than me and Sebastian, only in a different way. What's the problem, Anne? He reached down to kiss her and she smacked his face. Where have you been all night? You know I wouldn't fool around on you, precious, he said. You're all I've ever wanted. That was a wonderful picture of him declaring his love for her after she slapped him silly, but I needed David gone, like yesterday. And please, I said, let Robbie do what he came to do. You want that thing out of here? He pointed to David's shriveled up body, but looked at me. Get rid of it, Robbie, I said. I'll see that Sebastian takes care of you later. When he wakes up. Did she do this? He said to Anne. Then taking a look at me. No. She's a human. The only way she could kill him would be to shoot him or another type of lethal weapon. This dude was killed by magic. Black magic. A witch. Robbie walked to examine the body. Yeah. She sucked the life out of him. Which makes her twice as dangerous. He looked at me. You have anyone to protect you from that bitch? She has her boyfriend, Anne said. Where is he? Robbie asked, turning to me, but Anne answered. He's in the cellar. Tell him to come up and help me with this. We either have to burn him or bury him. 
He can't come up, I said. He's sleeping. Not until dark. Robbie hoisted David over his shoulder and dropped him inside a sheet which earlier had covered an old tattered sofa. Then he wrapped him in it. Turning to me, he said, when he wakes up, you can't be here. You have to go on with your routine as if nothing happened. Don't you want to know why he's sleeping in a dark rat-infested cellar? Not unless he isn't a vampire and he just likes to sleep in a cellar, then in that case, I don't need to know. He lifted the body up and headed out the door. He kissed Anne and then headed into the rear of the mansion. Does Robbie know what Sebastian is? I asked, bewildered. Of course he does, Anne said. And that doesn't bother him? Nothing bothers a werewolf, she said. Does that bother you? Of course not, I said straightforward. Why should I be worried about a werewolf when my pretend husband is a vampire and the woman trying to kill us both is a witch? There was no way I would let a little thing like a werewolf affect me. After we cleaned up all signs that I had been there, Anne drove back to the hospital to report that she couldn't find David, and I drove the Land Rover home amidst the pouring down rain. When I reached home, I rushed upstairs and took a shower and dropped into bed. Before I fell into a deep sleep, I wondered when this was going to end. I woke when I felt a cool body next to mine. When I turned, he was staring at me. Do you know what I should do? No. Tell me. I should put you in time out, the way I did when you were A. He didn't complete his sentence. Did you mean when I was a child? It was your face I remember. You were the one who took care of me. It wasn't me, you're wrong. You're just projecting it onto me. How could you remember something that long ago? I meant when I became a teenager. I remember your face now. I remember living with you in England after you took me away. He stopped talking and watched me. Did I uncover something I shouldn't have? Why did he react when I said I was a child? Was it him who stole me away from my parents and he didn't want to admit it? Why did you take me away to England and abandon me in front of a church? I searched for you for days. I didn't eat or sleep. His face changed when he heard the truth from me. You want to know too much. He made a gesture as if he would step out of the bed, but I reached for his arm and that stopped him. I want to know why you wouldn't let me live with you. I remember being in love with you when I was fifteen. It was just a crush, but it was real. Sebastian glared at me. When are you going to tell me? I said to him. I can't tell you. I want to make love to you. It will ruin everything for you and me right now. I thought you were angry with me, and now you want to make love to me. Well, until you're truthful with me, and I can learn the truth about what happened to me when I was a child, and you reveal to me who's trying to kill me and why then I don't want to be near me. I pushed him away. Releasing his arm, he stood and watched at me, but he still wouldn't tell me what I needed to hear.